If you have your sermon notes, you see that the title of today's message is The Gift of Wilderness Experiences. And you can see a little picture of a wilderness there. And actually, that's uh, almost a forest of wilderness compared to much of the wilderness that we're going to talk about today in southern Israel, because it is almost like a lunar landscape. The, the geography of southern Israel is in some places so barren that you can find nothing there except just scorched earth. There's nothing growing at all. Nothing. I can't even imagine a scorpion living there. There is just rock and sand and high heat and nothing green ever grows there. Uh, that's much of southern Israel. Now there's pockets there that are different, but it's like almost the surface of the moon. It's amazing. So when I'm talking about wilderness, I'm talking about a place that's not exactly your idea or my idea of a vacation paradise. It's a place of pain. It's a place of loneliness. It's a place of despair. It's a place where God refines his people. And refinement is something we all think is a wonderful thing. Refining is good as long as it's happening to someone else. But when it happens to us, we cry out like, God, what are you doing? Like this morning when my mom has pneumonia and my wife has a migraine. And neither one of those things literally physically touched me, but they emotionally touched me. And I'm like, God, do it. Did I really need that this morning? And he smiles and goes, yep. You did. And yes, you do. And honestly, it's not that big a deal. My mom is on medication. She's hopefully getting better. Hopefully by the time I get home this afternoon, my wife will be better. So, you know, this is not life changing dis disasters, right? Many times we enter into wilderness areas and they're life changing. And that's what God intends. He intends wilderness experiences and wilderness places in our lives to change us to increase us to maturity and conformity to Christ. Do you desire to be more like Jesus? If you actually desire that, and that is your heart's desire to know God and love God and walk with Him, then you're going to have to go through some wilderness experiences. And He's going to lead you in places you may not want to go. And that's true of all of us. Every single person who loves him in Jesus Christ, he's going to refine. And before we even get into the, the Bible verses that talk about this, I want to give you a picture. A mental image that you can hold on to of what God is actually doing. Because refinement and wilderness are they're synonymous. They're not pleasant. It is very difficult and painful to endure wilderness places with God but he has a holy purpose. So here's your mental image. I want you to think, I want you to think of a master sword maker in Japan in 1500 AD. Okay, 1500, master sword maker. So he's refined the steel and now he's forming it into the shape of a sword. And here's the, the rough process that he takes it through. First, he has this lump of steel that's already refined as steel, but it's not a sword, it's just a hunk of steel. So then he heats it up almost to the point of it starting to turn liquid again. It's red hot steel. And then he starts pounding the snot out of it. And he shapes it into the approximate shape of a sword. And then he heats it up again to that hot, almost molten state. And he folds it in on itself. He folds it in half and then he pounds it out again. And then he cools it. And then he heats it up. And he folds it, and he pounds it, and he cools it. And he does this more than 200 times. All the while, he's heating it and folding it and pounding it. He's forming it into the shape of what it will be, a perfect sword with amazing steel that has flexibility and strength all in one. It's an amazing tool when he's done rare in this world. That is what God is doing when he takes us each through our own wilderness experience. It's brutal. It's painful. It knocks the snot out of us. And I, I'm saying that you, you might be laughing at that expression, but if you've ever had yourself knocked silly, you know what I'm talking about. So God does this to us. 
to bring us to maturity in Christ. And most of us don't sign up for that. Most of us want God's love, amen? And, and most of us want blessings from God that we think are going to make us feel good. We want pleasure, not pain. And yet, if you've ever played sports, you know there is no gain without pain. If you want to be a champion, you've got to put in all the work before the season even starts. You've got to do all the weight training. You've got to all the, do all the nutrition training. You've got to do all, everything the coach tells you to do. And all that goes into being part of a championship team is a lot of work. Sweaty, hard, back-breaking labor. And most of us as Christians don't think that way. We don't think of sweaty, hard labor in following Christ, in becoming mature in Christ. If, if you said to anybody, hey, do you want to go to church and get really sweaty and, and get a lot of blisters? You think anybody would come? And yet God is inviting us to fullness of life that is beyond anything this world has to compare through a wilderness experience. Do you think I'm making this up? How about the people of Israel? Freed from slavery, taken into the wilderness. How about Joseph, given two amazing dreams from God? Spent 17 plus years in a wilderness experience. David, anointed king. And where did his life go from there? Let's take a look. Because we're gonna look at David. And if you, if, if you study his life in serious detail, if you study the history of David's life, you realize that most people that study David's life think that he was actually anointed by Samuel when he was somewhere between 10 and 15 years of age. Now, can you remember what you were like when you were 10? Do you think the, the prophet of Israel should have anointed you when you were 10 years old? Not even when you're 15, right? So... David was anointed by God's own prophet in front of his entire village of Bethlehem to be the king of Israel when he was just a punk. That's how he began. This is the beginning of God forming David to be a godly, great king. And he goes from that anointing moment back to his normal job, which was taking care of sheep. Not exactly, you know, page one news, right? You don't normally think of shepherding sheep as king-making material. And yet, he's anointed, and then he goes to take care of the, the sheep of his dad. And he has his part-time gig. The king has this mental health issue where he goes into rages, and so he calls for music to be played, and David's a well-known musician. So he's drafted into the king's palace to sit in a dark corner and play music, you know, generic soft music in the background to mellow the king out. So he's a shepherd by day, music guy by night, and that's David's life. Now that's not exactly bad, but it's not world changing either, is it? It's pretty generic, pretty boring. So this is his humble service. And then he goes from anointing and playing music for the king to taking groceries to his brothers on the front line when the armies of Israel and the Philistines are facing each other. So there's going to be a major battle. Men are going to die. And his dad sends them, not with a sword, not with arrows, but with loaves of bread, a few pieces of cheese. Not exactly what you think of for, you know, mighty warriors to carry around. So he shows up at the front lines, finds out what's going on. And long story short, he, not the armies of Israel, defeats the giant Goliath with a small stone, no state-of-the-art weapons, no massive power, no tanks, no rockets, just a small stone. Now he's a national hero. So he's been anointed, playing music for the king, national hero! Now his face is on the cover of Time magazine. Now everybody wants to interview him, right? He wants to be on the Today Show and the Tonight Show and everything in between. He's famous still probably 11 to 16 years of age. Not very much time has passed. Where do you go from there? Well, 
it just keeps getting better for David because now he's promoted to be general of the armies of Israel. Again, do you think in your wildest imaginations that that's even remotely a good choice? There's not a 16-year-old in the world I would trust with the armies of the United States. But God gave David the armies of Israel, and he began to lead them. Now, I can't imagine his first day on the job, because I've had a few jobs where my first day on the job, I was a little bit freaked out. I'm like, I have no clue what I'm doing here. Have you ever felt that way? Suddenly you're put into this position, and you've got stuff to do, and you're like, how in the world did I get here? Right? And that's what David's, I'm sure he's feeling, because now he's just a teenager, and he's in charge of men Men who have been trained for warfare, men who have fought in battles, been there, done that. And David has done what? Herded sheep, played music for the king, thrown a rock. That's what David's done. But now he's the commander. He's got all the stars on his shoulders. And he has to lead the men. Again, this is great training for a future king. I think God knows what he's doing. Looks a little odd, but David makes it work. And the people sing his praises. He goes from good, 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 great to a situation where now his boss, the king of Israel, takes a spear in his hand and tries with all his might to turn David into a butterfly for his collection. You know what I'm saying? A pin through the gut stuck to the wall. This is what King Saul tries to do to David. And he does this more than once. He attempts to murder David in the palace. So he goes into a rage, takes a spear, and chases David. And throws the spear at David and sticks the spear into the wall. These are stone walls, by the way. And the spear sticks in the wall. That's thrown with a little bit of force. David is now entering the wilderness zone. And he has to run for his life. This isn't just a bad day. We've all had bad days. This is now a bad life where the king of the entire country wants him dead. And so as he begins his journey into the wilderness zone, this is how it starts for David. He goes to the one man he knows he can trust that might be able to save his skin, and that is the prophet Samuel, who's at Naoth in Ramah. And he goes to Samuel. Samuel, save me. He goes, I can't control. The prophet goes, I, I have nothing to do with Saul. He is out of my hands. He's out of God's will. You can't stay here because he's going to come and kill you. So the prophet does not help David. Gives him a little rest, gives him a little food, sends him on his way. So then he goes to the next place he thinks he can trust the leadership. He goes to the city of Nob where the, the priests have their selves established. This is the, the priestly city in all of Israel because Jerusalem is not yet their capital. So he goes to Nob and he talks to the chief priests. He says, please feed me, I'm starving. So he gives him some of the holy bread that's there for the, the tabernacle worship and gives him holy bread, which is a prefigure of us eating the bread of life, which is Jesus. That's, that's a pretty cool picture. We're in need. He was in need. God provides the need. And he gives him a weapon. He gives him the giant's sword. Goliath's sword is at the city of the priests. I'm sure on display for all the Israelites to come see when they bring offers, offerings and sacrifices. So David says, well, I need a sword. I'll take that one. The priest gives it to him. I mean, who killed the giant? David. Who deserves the sword? David. Makes sense. So David runs him off into the hills because he can't stay there. As a matter of fact, this isn't included in your notes. But Saul does come to the city of Nob, and in his anger, he murders the priests. Eighty-five priests and their families and their children and their animals. Wipes out the city. That's King Saul. That's how angry he is at David. Sinning against God, murdering an entire city of priests. 
David now runs to the only place he can think of, the only established fortified city that he thinks might be able to hold off Saul. It's a Philistine city, which is the capital of the king of the Philistines, Achish. Can you imagine yourself trying to get away from the IRS? They're going to garnish your wages and take your house. So you're going to go to North Korea? Really? But this is what David did. It's the only safe place he can think of. But he realizes, you know what? This probably isn't such a good idea. They know who I am. So he pretended to be insane. Now, you and I could probably make that work for maybe an afternoon, but not for very long. Even if you're really creative and really artistic and really theatrical, you're not going to be able to pull this off for very long. So David had to run away from there as well. Now he is truly in the wilderness. He goes to the cave of Adullam. He goes to the forest of Hereth. He goes to the city of Keilah. And in all these places, Saul and his army is chasing David and trying to kill him. There's different situations that happen. God actually allows David to be in a cave and to be on top of a mountain when Saul and his armies approach. And Saul actually goes into the cave that David is already in control of. David's in the back of the cave. Saul doesn't know he's there. It's a hot day in the wilderness, probably 120 degrees with no shade. So he goes to the only cool place there is, the back of a cave. And he's going to take a nap. So he goes in there. Actually, he's going to use the restroom, and then he's going to take a nap. And that's what Saul does. And as he's asleep in the cave, David comes up and cuts off the bottom of Saul's robe. And then he leaves. Now all of his troops are saying, David, now is your chance. Kill him. He's been trying to kill you. It's self-defense, right? You can hear all the rationalizations. You can hear all the arguments. I mean, let's be real. Saul doesn't like you. He's not going to stop until he literally pins you to the ground with his own spear. So kill him. He's asleep. He's at your feet. Solve your problem. How many of you would obey that advice? Come on, be honest. Absolutely. I'm not a very godly man. I, you know, I'm ashamed to say it. I'm embarrassed to say it. I, I had to do this. When I was preparing this lesson, I'm like, man, I would have killed him in a heartbeat. He's been trying to kill me. I am the anointed king. Off with his head. But here's David's attitude. David trusted God. And who was in control of Saul? God. So David said, I will not lift my hand against God's anointed. Do I believe Saul's correct? No. Do I like Saul? No. Do I want to spend any time in his presence? Absolutely not. But am I going to touch him? Am I going to harm him? No. Who's going to have to solve the problem of Saul? God. God anointed Saul. Only God can remove Saul. So David doesn't touch him. You and I need to consider that deeply. There's more than a few people running our country right now in both city and county and state and federal levels in both legislature and executive and judicial positions that I absolutely disagree with. How about you? Yes. They've made a few decisions lately that I'm like, are you absolutely out of your freaking mind? Yes. More than a few times. And so... I would like in my sinful flesh to take a spear into the Capitol building and let them know what I really think. I'd probably get me arrested on the spot. So I have withheld that. I haven't gone there. But if I'm going to be like David, if I'm going to be like Jesus, if I'm going to allow God to mature me to completeness in Christ, I'm going to trust God for his work in all those people. And pray for him. And humble myself. David did. He humbled himself. Now, here's the next, the next thing we need to catch, though. 
David didn't harm Saul. David trusted God. Did that mean that he got his get out of jail card free? Did he get out of the wilderness? No, it kept on going. This wilderness experience of David was like the original Energizer Bunny. It kept going and going and going and going. It didn't end. As a matter of fact, the bad news just kept getting worse. So he then leaves the city of Keilah. You know, he was in the cave, was in the forest, was in another city. Now he goes into the, the wilderness of Ziph, and Saul's army just keeps chasing him. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, this just keeps going on. And occasionally, David would confront Saul and say, Dude, what are you chasing me for? I've only blessed you. I've never harmed you. And publicly, Saul would repent and say, David, you're more righteous than I am. I repent. Please bless me and bless my children. Because he recognizes he's going to be the next king. And David goes, amen, God's will be done. And Saul goes back to his city. And Saul's not in his own home one week, and he's back in the wilderness chasing David again. So Saul is continually hounding David with an army bigger than David's. And they go from the wilderness of Ziv to the wilderness of Ma'an to the wilderness of En Gedi to the wilderness of Paran. This is like the four corners of wilderness in southern Israel. So if you can picture southern Israel with the Dead Sea, which is on the east side, and all the way over to the coast in these four corners, that's the wildernesses we're talking about. And there's almost nothing out there. Lots of mountains, lots of sun-baked rock. You can see En Gedi is the one spot that has water. And it's gorgeous. The En Gedi is this long, uh, very rugged canyon area that goes from mountains down to the Dead Sea. So this stream, these Three waterfalls cascade down this long canyon network from almost the coast of Israel all the way in to where the Dead Sea is. So it's dropping down, down, down the whole way. And that's where David hid from Saul many times. There's huge cave networks through here. Little caves, big caves, all kinds of caves. And then this is where David hid out a lot because it's the only place he can get water. So there's wildlife there, they can hunt, they can drink, they can eat, they can hide in the caves. And so this is one of the places that David confronted Saul. But in all this, what's going on? What do you think is happening to David during all these years? One of the things that's happening is he's not only having to run, but he's having to protect people. He's learning kingly skills on the run. This isn't in your notes, but I'm just going to tell you what happened when David first started running into the wilderness. The distressed and the outcast of Israel came to him. Now think about this. If you want to have a great fighting force, if you want to have the world's strongest army, do you want the distressed and the outcast coming to you? It would be kind of like if we went down to Loaves and Fishes to recruit our army and police force. The distressed, the homeless, the outcasts. You're realizing right now what that's like, don't you? And those are the people that came to David. And at this time, when he's going to these four different wilderness areas, he's got 600 men and their wives and their children and their flocks and their herds with him. So he has a small city with him. And he is the guy in charge. So as they're running from Saul, they'll literally, literally be on one side of the mountain. Let's say they're on the west side, Saul be on the east side, and they're going like ring around the rosy. They're chasing each other around this mountain. And David realizes, I can't keep doing this. His army's faster because they're not traveling with their women and children. They're going to catch us. So he pulls the wild card out of his hat of the city of the Philistine king, Achish. And he goes there again. And this time, he pretends to become a vassal for the king of the Philistines. I will serve you. Whoever you want me to attack, I will go attack them. I will be your small army. And the king goes right on, because the king recognizes what a great military leader that David is. So he makes him a vassal. 
gives him the city of Ziklag. Now David's got a home. Now you, you would think, okay, I'm out of the wilderness. I've actually got a bed to sleep in. I've got a roof over my head. My wives can cook dinner. Wives, plural, because he had two. His children can play in the dining room, in the living room, have their own bedroom. So things are good. Things are looking up, right? Well, David, the shrewd, godly man that he is, actually is not attacking the Israelites. He's attacking other Philistine towns and villages. So he takes his men out, goes on a raid, and attacks a Philistine town or village, wipes it off the face of the earth so there's no survivors, no witnesses. Nobody can go back to the king in Achish and say, hey, David's killing us. So David gets away with this for months, maybe a year. And he's doing great work, cleaning the Philistines out of the Israel territory. But one day they go on a raid and they come back. And you know what they see when they come back home? What do you see when you come back home? What do you look for? You, know, you want the light on, right? The door shut and locked. You, you, nothing's broken. Nothing's destroyed. David and his army show back up to Ziklag and every house has been burned to the ground. It's a smoking ruin. All the cattle, all the sheep have been stolen. All the women and children have been kidnapped. There's nothing left but smoke and ashes. And after they check everything, they're, they're looking like, okay, where's my baby? Where's my wife? Where's my sheep? You know, they look, they make sure, okay, everything's gone. Here's what happens next. The army says these words. It's in your word. It's in the Bible. Let's stone him. They blame David. Who took us out on this journey? David did. Who was responsible for us not being here to protect our own wives and children and homes? It's David's fault. Let's kill David. So not only does he have Saul and his armies after him, David's own army is mutinying and want to kill him on the spot. And he has his own grief because his wives and his children and his flocks are gone. So David's been wiped out. He's grieving over the loss of his family, and you can understand what that would feel like. And his army's turning against him. This is now the most crucial point in David's life. This is more important than when he faced Goliath. This is more important than when Saul tried to kill him with a spear the first time. This is more important than when Saul had David in his hands in the cave and let him go. The next words in the Word of God are pivotal in David's life and they're crucial for you and me. If we're going to grow to maturity in Christ, if we're going to allow God to make us as strong and godly as he wants us to be in Christ, these are the words we need to highlight, memorize, and understand deeply. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. Moreover, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him. For all the people were embittered, each one because of his sons and daughters had been kidnapped. But here's the sentence. But David strengthened himself in Yahweh his God. I've been a pastor for 30 years. And I've seen all kinds of situations that people have, you know, explode in their lives. All kinds of things. And every single person makes one of two choices. You do, I do, everybody does. When the crisis explodes, we either choose to draw near to God or we leave Him. And you've seen this and I've seen this. People will draw near to God or they will leave God. And they'll choose the sins of the world. We'll seek our comfort in God or we'll find our comfort in the, all the evil sin of the world. Why do you think drug addictions are never going away in our country? We've spent billions and billions of dollars fighting the so-called war on drugs. Have we made a dent in it? Have we stopped it at all? No. Because people are seeking escape through drugs. They're not drawing near to God. And that is the curse of our society. We're seeking sinful pleasures at every turn instead of seeking the one true God. Who, in Jesus' own words, wants his joy to be our joy. And overflowing. 
So when the crisis hits, and none of us are immune, we all deal with pain and grief and loss. We all do. Will we choose to strengthen ourselves in God? Will we humble ourselves when people are looking for rocks to pick up to hit us over the head? Will we bow before God and trust Him? When our heart is absolutely ripped out of our chest because of grief, because of loss, will we worship God? That's the key for David. This is the turning point in his life. He doesn't know it yet. He's still in the wilderness. Physically, nothing's changed. But that moment is the turning point. Everything changes from that moment forward. Look what happens. In 1 Samuel 27, 28, 29, 30, David now seeks God, asks God, do I go after the Amalekites? Because the Amalekites are the ones that burned his town down. God says, yes, go after him. So he rouses the troops, and they saw, they saw David worship God. That one heart for God changed the hearts that wanted to kill him. So David worshiped God. They have been, I don't know, embarrassed, shamed into recognizing God's in control, and they're not. Those men change their minds. They begin following David. They chase after the Amalekites. And they're about halfway there. Now, it's not hard to follow camels. You know, when you've got an army on camels and you've got women and children and slaves drugged behind them, it's not hard to follow those tracks. There's lots of tracks to follow. But they're fast. The only thing slowing that army down is the women and children, the dragon behind them. So they're going as fast as they can back home. David and his men are behind them maybe a day, but they're chasing. And they come upon a dying Egyptian slave, a slave abandoned by the Amalekites. The Amalekites brought this slave with them. He was started dying. They left him to die. David stops his army, gives the man water, gives the man food, and revives him. This is an act of supernatural kindness because this man is not an Israelite, he's not a Jew, he's not a child of Abraham, he's an Egyptian, he's an idolater, he's a slave from a foreign land. And David stops trying to rescue his family and rescues a man he does not know. Does it remind you of a story Jesus told? The Good Samaritan. When we stop in the midst of our crisis and we strengthen ourselves in God, then his spirit works through us to bless other people in powerful ways. But we have to strengthen ourselves in God, not our situations and not our sinful pleasures, but in God. And when we do that, he saves lives of other people through us. So that Egyptian was saved physically. And then he told David and the army, oh, you're chasing the Amalekites. They left me. I'll tell you how to find them. And he tells them where they're at. And so David and his army chases even harder but they had to leave 200 of the men behind because they were exhausted. And if you've ever been exhausted, you know what it's like when you can't take one more step. So 200 of the guys are left to take care of all their baggage. And they, they drop everything but their weapons and they chase the Amalekites, catch them and destroy them. Rescue every wife, every child, every sheep, everything the Amalekites stole. And they come back and David shares all the booty, everything the Amalekites had, they got. Not, not only their property, but all the other stuff the Amalekites have stolen. So now instead of being destitute, now they're rich. David's army is. And he shares it equally with the soldiers that fought and the soldiers that stayed behind exhausted. David's loving kindness is more than generous. Again, like Jesus, isn't it? When we go through wilderness experiences, we are being matured by God to maturity in Christ, to be made more like Jesus. And when we're made more like Jesus, we are used by God to be a blessing in other people's lives. 
that give life and power and healing. God does miracles through every person that trusts in him in the midst of the wilderness. But there's pain in that process. David did righteous, he did nothing but righteous deeds and he was attacked for it continually by the king of Israel. He had to leave his best friend and then his wife at the beginning stages of this in 1 Samuel 19. He had to leave his best friend Jonathan and he had to leave his wife. In 1 Samuel 21, he was starving by the time he got to the city of the priests. He had nothing, not even a biscuit. He knew the pain of starvation. They had to pretend to be insane in 1 Samuel 21. He was responsible for 600 outcasts. I mean, when you're on the run, it's hard enough to take care of yourself, let alone 600 other people plus their wives and children. And that's what David had to do on a daily basis. And in 1 Samuel 25, David was grossly insulted after doing great good. How do you feel when that happens to you? I mean, if you do something that is truly a wonderful act of kindness that was hard work for you to do, and you do it, and then you're grossly insulted for it, how would you feel? David returned kindness for insult. David's graduation from the wilderness happened when he strengthened himself in God. But it took days for it to manifest itself. It took the death of Saul and Jonathan. It took his hometown Ziklag to be burned, his families to be kidnapped. And then David strengthened himself. While David was chasing the Amalekites and destroying them and rescuing his wives and his children, the Philistines were attacking Israel. And they killed Saul. And they killed Jonathan. So David's best friend has just been destroyed. This is what David does that shows he has now graduated from God's academy of wilderness. This is a, I'm going to give you a word that we almost never use. But it's a biblical word. When David heard the news that Saul had been killed and Jonathan had been killed and the armies of Israel had been destroyed, David lamented. To lament is to grieve powerfully. It's to wail and scream and rip your clothes in pain. It's to fully involve yourself in the loss. It's not just going up to somebody and go, I'm so sorry for your loss. Now that's not a bad thing to say, but that's not lamenting. That is not fully entering into the, the deep power of grief. And that's what David did. David was a passionate man. And when he entered into grief, he grieved with all his heart. And so he actually wrote a song of lament for Saul. He blessed Saul in his grief. And all of Israel started singing that song. And it's in your Bibles today. That's how important it is to God. That's how righteous it is for us to lament. There are things that we should grieve over and we should grieve deeply. And we should cry not just once, but for days. David grieved for days for Saul and for Jonathan. And we should too. There are things in our nation today we should grieve over. We talk about it from time to time. Abortion is the murder of unborn babies. Every murder is something we should grieve over. And there's all kinds of immorality that's just been made, been made state law. We should grieve over the perverseness of what our government is doing. We should lament and wail so that people will hear our grief. This is how God led David through 10 to 15 years of wilderness. It wasn't 10 to 15 days. It wasn't two months. 
it was 10 to 15 years. And God raised him up to be an amazing leader for God's people. How much do you want God to use you? Are you willing to follow Jesus in the midst of the wilderness? When Jesus began his ministry, what did he do? He was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days. Will we let God lead us where he wants to form us to maturity in Christ? I pray that your answer is yes. And I pray that for all of us, me included, we will draw near to God when the tough times come. Let's pray. Father, I stand here with my brothers and sisters and I am honestly nothing like David. I would have killed someone. And yet David is more righteous because he withheld his hand and he blessed his enemy. Jesus, that is what you've taught us. You've taught us to bless those who curse us. You've taught us to love our enemies. You've taught us to draw near to you in all circumstances so that you can work and so that you will be glorified. So Lord, I pray that you will use us like you used David, so that you will use us like you used David's army of outcasts. Lord, we don't think we're anything great. We know we're not, in the world's eyes, hot stuff. But we know you've adopted us into your family through Christ Jesus. We know that you are the great king. We know that you are sovereign over every bit of our lives. And so, Lord, at this moment, we humbly acknowledge you alone are our God and king. And you have every right to do anything you want with us. Your will is perfect, and our will is inherently selfish. So in this very second, we all, by faith, surrender ourselves to you. And we say, Lord, be pleased to do with us whatever you desire, that you could glorify yourself through us and in us for the glory of Jesus, for your kingdom, and so that we can bear much fruit for you. Lord Jesus, I pray this in your holy name. Amen.